Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first event of the third session of Work Ready. If you're a returning attendee, welcome back. If you're new here, welcome. We're happy that you're here with us tonight. Tonight, we're kicking off this session with a really exciting program, how to learn new skills to get a job. If you can't hear me or having technical issues, let me know in the chat and I'll reach out to you and do my best to help you out. If you'd like to call in, uh, that number is on the title card that should be on your screen right now. I'll now also post it in the chat uh, momentarily. Let me tell you a little bit about Work Ready. The Work Ready program is designed to help people affected by COVID get a job or improve their work situation by getting a raise or promotion or planning for a more sustainable career. We're doing that in three ways. In three ways. First, we're battling the digital divide by lending out laptops and Wi-Fi hotspots out of 20 of our library locations for six week periods through 2021. During each of those sessions, we're also hosting weekly live events on different work related topics like learning new skills. And lastly, we're purchasing the latest and greatest books and ebooks on test prep, teleworking, writing business plans, networking, resumes, and much more. To sign up for a laptop or see the rest of our live events for the rest of the third session, all you have to go, all you have to do is go to LACountylibrary.org and click on the work ready link and fill out the simple form. And once again, I'm Anna Sylvia Torres and I am a librarian here at LA County Library and I will be moderating tonight's event. Before we get into tonight's event, however, I do want to introduce Alina Petitanian from the Los Angeles County Department of Consumer and Business Affairs. And she will give a brief presentation tonight. Welcome, Alina, and thank you so much for being here. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. My name is Alina Patatanyan, and I'm an acting supervisor with the LA County Department of Consumer and Business Affairs is Reading for Soon program. Today, I will talk about the two um, new recent um, ordinances that became effective in LA County that um, that affects a lot of employees and employers. So. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, I, if you can see, can you all see my screen? Yep, yes, it's there. See. Okay, so today we will talk about the prevention and retaliation for reporting public health violation ordinance and the hero pay ordinance. First is the public health and retaliation ordinance, which was passed last year on November 24, 2020. Um, during the COVID-19, uh, the health officer has issued and continues to issue a lot of health officer orders. And employers that do not, uh, there, there are some employers who do not comply by the health officer orders. Um, and when employees uh, started reporting these violations, they started getting retaliated against. Um, so uh, there was an urgency to pass this ordinance which prevents employers of retaliating against employees for reporting or discussing any public health violation. And it is not only related to COVID-19, but any public health violation. Um, examples of retaliation include a termination, demotion, pay reduction. Um, so if any adverse action is taken against an employee, that could be considered retaliation. Um, that could, could be considered retaliation. Our department is um, authorized uh, by the department, uh, the LA County Board of Supervisors to enforce this ordinance to protect the employees from being retaliated. Uh, employees can file a complaint with our department. And once we receive a complaint, we investigate and we have a one year to investigate and conclude this case. Uh, if we find any violations of the public health anti retaliation ordinance, we can issue a citation to the business, which is like a ticket. And then we can cite the business uh, up to $10,000 per violation per day. Um, this amount is very hefty because it can add up because it is per violation per day. Um, of course, employer can um, contest to this um, uh, violation and they can argue that it is not true by filing uh, an administrative hearing, like an appeal in front of a hearing officer. So this was our first um, ordinance. The next I'm going to talk about the uh, LA County Hero Pay Ordinance, which became effective on February 26, 2021. And this ordinance is good only for the next 120 days, unless the Board of Supervisors decides to extend this ordinance. So um, the Hero Pay Ordinance applies to grocery um, or drug retail stores that sell primarily food or prescription and non-prescription medication. 
or if it is a big store with 85,000 square feet and dedicate 10% or more of its sales to food or drug. And also they must meet the following requirements. They must be in the unincorporated area of the county. Uh, they must be either publicly traded or have 300 employees nationwide. And uh, they must employ more than 10 employees per store. As we can see that there are a lot of requirements here to qualify for the QOP for the business to uh, be um, applicable for the hero pay. Um, uh, if I can give you examples of which stores may qualify for this, which is um, big stores such as CVS Pharmacy, Walgreens, Greater Joe's, Sprout, Rob, such stores. It does not apply to small businesses. Um, or also this ordinance, um, there are exemptions to this ordinance. It does not apply to public entities, such as government entities, federal, state, county, incorporated cities, and also school districts. As I mentioned, um, the business, uh, the store has to be in the unincorporated area of the county. Um, and what does unincorporated mean? It's, it's those areas in the county where um, they don't belong to the city. They don't have their own city hall. They don't have their own city council. If, uh, let's say you want to get a business license, you would have to do, go to the county to get a business license. And in order uh, to check jurisdiction to find out if a business um, is located in an incorporated area of the county, as an employee, uh, are you qualified to get the hero pay? We have links here uh, through the county registrar recorder's office uh, where you can check the address and verify if it is an incorporated. So what are the requirements of the hero pay? The county hero pay amount is $5 per hour in, an, in, the, in addition to the employee's base wage, which means that, for example, if an employee is getting $15, they will get additional $5 for the starting from February 26 for the 120 days. Um, employees can choose to receive paid leave hours, like sick leave hours, instead of the hero pay amount. They just need to inform their employer in writing. And there's a formula that that accrual happens. And the, if there are businesses out there who are already providing voluntary hazard pay, they will get credit for that. And also there's a requirement to include information uh, about the hero pay on the pay statement. So there needs to be the hero pay amount and then total hours worth and the total amount received towards the hero pay. Another requirement there is on your screen, you can see the county hero pay poster. Any business that is required to pay the hero pay is required to post this poster in a conspicuous place in a business, noticeable place where employees can see and find out what they're entitled to, their rights under the ordinance. Um, again, the CBA, Department of Consumer and Business Affairs, is authorized to investigate complaints um, that have allegations of the hero pay ordinance. Um, if we find any violation, we may issue a wage enforcement order, uh, which is like a citation to get where we can assess fines payable to the county and or to the employee. And also where applicable, we can reinstate the employees to the position that they had. For example, if the employee was um, uh, fired, retaliated because they asked to get the pay, the hero pay, uh, we can reinstate those employees to their position. That concludes my presentation. Um, there, uh, here we have some contact information specific to public health on retaliation ordinance, hero pay, and also there's my email address, my name and my email address. Um, thank you for being here. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Even after the presentation, you can you can email me directly or you can email to the designated email with your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alina. Thank you for being with us and it was really great information. All right, so. Um, once again, thank you so much, um, Alina, for being here um, and for providing that information. Um, now let's get on to today's program, and I'm very excited to introduce our amazing speaker for tonight. If you're a work-ready veteran, then um, he really needs no introduction, um, but he's a lifelong learner who has been working at libraries from Lancaster to Lomita for over 20 years. May I present to you Oleg Kagan. Hello, hello. Thank you, Anna Sylvia, for that introduction. Um, I appreciate you moderating today, and uh, I 
join everybody who's on the program today to thank you for, for doing that. So I'm going to bring up my PowerPoint. There we go. And thank you very much, Alina, for telling us about the two important ordinances that are important for all LA County workers. Um, so welcome to how to learn new skills to get a job. The purpose of today's program is for you to get practical and immediately useful tips about learning new skills as job seekers. Now, I'm going to be talking about a lot of information. It's jam-packed into about 45 to 50 minutes. So if you miss something today, we are going to have a Q&A in the middle of the presentation and also towards the end. And of course, per usual, I'm going to send an email with Elena's presentation, with my presentation, and any links or documents that I talk about um, by email to you tomorrow. And this presentation will also be available uh, via YouTube on our YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash LA County Library in the work and career playlist. So if you miss something here, or you have to leave the program early or something, don't worry, you will be able to hear the program and watch the program again in the future. And if you really love it, you'll be able to recommend it to other people. <laughs> but we'll see. So the way that we're going to proceed today is by way of introduction where we are now, then we're going to jump right in to the learning journey. We're gonna talk a little bit about how to assess your learning style your, and all of the details that are involved with you and whatever skill that you're gonna learn. Then we're gonna jump into breaking down job descriptions, essentially where it all starts. We're gonna analyze the actual skill that you might wanna learn and I'll give you a few questions to think about that. And then I'll get into showing you the methods and the different resources that are available to you to learn new skills as a job seeker. I'll close with some practical tips and hopefully on a bit of a motivational note. So before the learning journey, hi, my name is Ole Kagan. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for LA County Library. I'm delivering this presentation to you tonight, not just because I've had a years long interest in the psychology of learning, but also because before becoming the community engagement coordinator, I've had all sorts of jobs. And these jobs have forced me to learn all sorts of skills. As a computer teacher, I've had experience teaching people job skills and so it's not just as an enthusiast of learning um, and psychology of learning that I come to you today, but also as a lifelong practitioner, both in my personal and professional lives. So that's me. How about you? Before we start learning any skill, I recommend answering some questions about yourself in order to develop the most effective strategy for you and your learning journey. The first question that you need to ask is how do I learn best? Now for some people, you immediately go to the idea of learning styles, which is to say, oh, I'm a visual learner. I'm a tactile learner. You know, I love, I need to write everything down to learn. And while though that's a good start, the idea of learning styles in that way has been scientifically discredited. It also doesn't make a whole lot of sense because consider if you want to learn Microsoft Excel, are you really going to just listen to an audiobook? Or if you want to learn a language, can you do that with tactile means? Of course not. You're going to, what you learn, the skill that you want to learn has to match with whatever style that makes sense for it. And so how do you decide how you learn best? Well, there are two questions that you can ask. The first is think about the best experiences that you've had in your life as a learner. Um, did you have a good teacher? Did you at some point take a really interesting course? Did you read a book that taught you a lot about a subject? What about those things made them effective for you? And then of course you can think about what situations were 
your worst learning experiences. And so when you plan your journey, you want to avoid whatever elements of that happened. If it was a terrible teacher, well, don't take any more classes from that teacher, but also think about the qualities of that teacher. And if you're going to be using a teacher to learn your skills, uh, make sure that you avoid those red flags. Is there urgency in what you're trying to learn? There's a big difference in how you plan your strategy. If you see a job application and the deadline is at a month and you need to learn a skill or two to be competitive for that job, you only have a month. And so that's going to determine how much time you're going to have to spend learning that skill. If you have all the time in the world or you're just learning something for fun, then you don't, you don't have as much of a hurry and you can relax a little bit. Related to style and time is access. So if you need to learn something in two weeks or a month, then you're going to use different resources than if you're going to learn if you have a lot of time. And in that situation, you may have to, it may be worthwhile to invest some money into developing that skill. Um, the, all the resources that I'm going to be telling you about today are free. However, just because something is free and available, there's so much available online. Um, there's just learning resources are in abundance. There's more learning resources now than ever before. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily the best for what you need and your time limit. Brain cycles. What, what I, I wrote brain cycles here, but really what I mean by that is a clash between willpower and life's responsibilities. It's really a, a tug of war there because you might have all the self-discipline in the world. You might be the most disciplined person that anybody of your friends know. And yet, if you have a full-time job and have to take care of your kids and a sick parent or relative, by the time you finish with all of those responsibilities, you may only have 30 minutes in the evening to learn anything. And so you have to consider how many brain cycles you actually have. On the other hand, you may have all the time in the world, but you're not very disciplined. And then you have to consider that as well in your strategy. Very important to take into account right at the beginning is how much you already know. So for me, if I was trying to better my Spanish, I would think, okay, well, I've taken classes in in a high school. I took a little bit of Spanish community college, so I have some fundamentals. And so what that means is that it would probably be more useful for me to join a conversation group or work directly with a teacher than go to a community college and do a beginner's class or even an intermediate course. Because if I do that, I'm already going to be repeating things that I know. And what I really need is conversation. And what that brings me to is fear. Everybody that, well, I'm say most people that are trying to learn something, especially at the beginner level, are afraid. Back when I was a computer teacher, I would often do one-on-one -on -one weekly lessons with, uh, with folks who had never used computers before. These people were scared. We would be starting with like, here's a keyboard, here's a mouse, here's the on button. And you may be able to relate, but there are so many people that, that would try to turn the computer on and their hand would be trembling because they were so scared of this thing that they have never done before. Well, fear is totally normal when you're learning something. And I'll tell you that even those people that were extremely afraid of learning computers all ended up learning computers. Some took longer, some didn't take as long, but everybody can learn. So we learned about me. We talked a little bit about the questions that you can ask yourself. Now let's get right into it. Every job description has essentially the same elements. And that's these five, knowledge, degree certification, disposition, experience, and skill. And of course, there's also the description of, a, of the company usually, which I didn't include here. So two of these are essentially yes or no questions. Do you have a degree in whatever topic? Do you have a food handles license if you're working at a restaurant? If the answer is no, then you might not be qualified for that job. I say might, note that. If you don't have a certain amount of experience, if say it requires five years working at exposition, if you don't have that, 
you might not qualify for that job. Knowledge, on the other hand, is much more amorphous. Knowledge means that you have an understanding of a topic. It's something that's inside your head. So it's usually something general. Like you have an understanding of an industry, or you have, if you're a librarian, you have the understanding of like the information landscape. So you kind of know where to search and what information is available where. Disposition is what's inside you. It's like who you are. So it might be that you're detail oriented or you like a fast paced environment. We'll cover some examples very soon. And finally, skill, which is the reason that we're here today. There, a skill is the task you do when you're on the job. There are hard skills and soft skills and many different ways to talk about them. Um, we'll get to some of those later on. So let's look at a couple of examples. So here is an example that I pulled off indeed.com and did a little bit of formatting to. And I understand the, the font is extremely tiny on the actual job description. When I send you the presentation tomorrow, you can, you can make it out. But right now I've pulled out a few examples. This is a jo the job administrative assistant at the LA Cafe. So let's first look at the disposition. So it's, it's an administrative assistant. It's not quite an entry level position, but almost. The, it's a fast paced job. The disposition that requires is able to effectively multitask in a fast paced environment. So there's going to be phone calls, you're going to be scheduling, you're going to be setting up interviews, you're going to be talking to a lot of people all the time. This job might not be for you if you're a laid back person. Now, is, are you an air traffic controller? Probably not. So you may not have to work in that fast pace of an environment, but you still have to consider whether you can, whether it's inside you to work in this kind of environment. There's also the experience, your proven experience as an administrative assistant or office admin assistant. Now note, it says proven experience, but it doesn't say how many years or exactly what kind of experience. It says some general job descriptions. So if you have six months of experience in an office doing the functions that are described in this job description, you should apply for the job. We've got some knowledge here. So the knowledge here is assist management and understanding commu and communicating, resolving employee relations issues. So this is knowledge because it's something that is in your head. What this means is that you need to be aware and able to handle office politics and have some ideas about supervision. So in case you need to help with, uh, with handling employee issues, you know how to do that. And we have two different types of skills here. We have proficiency in MS Office, which is a hard skill, and we have excellent oral and written communications. And I would say oral communications particularly is much more of a soft skill. So what I mean when I say hard skill is when you look at somebody's skill in Microsoft Excel, there's some tangible things that people can do in Excel. And it's very easy to assess whether somebody can do those things. You either can or you can't. So either you know pivot tables or you don't. On the other hand, oral skills are a lot more difficult to pinpoint in terms of competency. You know when people are, when people can communicate, and you know when somebody is good on the phone. But the difference between when somebody's excellent on the phone and when somebody's good on the phone is pretty hazy. Now, this description says excellent oral and written communication skills, and you should keep in mind that excellent here is a general term. Of course. You're not going to be giving, you know, Olympic level speeches here. These, this mean excellent or means you have to be good on the phone and the written communication skills means you have to be able to answer emails in a cogent manner. It's not, you don't have to be a best selling author or anything. Now, the final thing down on the bottom is bilingual fluent in Spanish is a plus. Now I have an asterisk. The reason for that is because that example is a language. It can be both knowledge and skill. It's skill if you're conversant in a language, if you're able to talk to people just at a basic level, even slightly above a basic level. Now, if you need to be, uh, if you're a trans there in an academic environment or like for the United Nations, or you're working at a high level in business and you're sort of, you're, you speak a language and you're also the cultural ambassador for a company. In that situation, you have to have a knowledge of that language and an idea in the, of the culture of the people who speak that language. So the language is one thing that combines skill and knowledge. 
moving forward. This is a job description for a data analyst at EDO. And in, according to the job description, EDO was founded in 2015 to transform how data is used within the media, entertainment, and advertising industries. And so you see right away, um, the first example I have here with the knowledge, understand our client needs and figure out how to present our data in compelling ways that match those needs. So you have to know something about the industries that this company works in. And knowing an industry is something that's very difficult to assess. You, you just, if you've worked in an industry, you have an awareness of what's happening there, then you have that knowledge. The degree certification one is also interesting in this job description. And I've specifically picked it to, to tell you about today. I picked this job description because it has things that are not completely obvious. You know, there are some job descriptions that say you need five years of experience here or that you need this degree and nothing else will do. Here it says educational background in quantitative discipline like mathematics, statistics, or engineering which means that you don't have to have a degree. You just have to have an educational background. So maybe you went to school uh, and did get a degree. In this, or if you've taken classes in those topics or you yourself taught in statistics, that will do. You have to be able to do the job of a data analyst, which requires a certain amount of knowledge in statistics. Now here you have another hard skill, experience in SQL and either R or Python. These are programming languages, and programming languages are a perfect example of a hard skill. They're technical skills. Now, here, when we're talking about competence, and I'll be talking about competence and mastery of skills a little bit later on in the presentation, but here we have experience in SQL. Experience in means that you probably don't have to be a master of SQL, R, or Python. You don't have to know everything about the language. You just have to be competent in it. You have to have some proficiency so that you can do the job. And of course, if you need to know something new that you don't know, you can always look it up. Here we have another disposition. And this disposition really gives you the idea of a spectrum of how somebody uh, can have a dis disposition. So here's patience and meticulousness necessary for precise data analysis and uh, data analysis and data exploration. I really like patience and meticulousness. This is very good. Uh, now, most, this is essentially, it's, it's a, you've got to be detail oriented. Now there's a difference between detail oriented. If you're running the register at Arby's, you have to be detail oriented there too. And if you're analyzing data as a data analyst at EDO, and the difference is the consequences. If you, if you give somebody the wrong change by a few cents, it's not really that big of a deal, but if you're cleaning up some data as a data analyst and you mess up in Excel and you're not paying attention and you run a report that's going to take two hours and then you use the incorrect data in that report to present to your superiors or clients uh, information that's going to give, make them or going to help them make the wrong decision, as it may cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, you've got to be a bit more detail oriented there. You've got to be, you've got to have patience and meticulousness. Uh, now, disposition at the bottom here, passion for movies, TV, and advertising. I really don't know who has a passion for advertising, but I'm sure those people are out there. But passion for movies and TV is also one of those things where you can be like, well, most people like movies and TV. So I would say that if you like movies and TV, you should apply for this job. If you hate movies and TV, then probably you should apply as a data analyst for a different organization. So here are the five elements again. And now, um, Anna Sylvia, do we have any questions in the chat? Take a short pause. Not at the moment. All mm -hmm. right. So in that case, we can move forward. Let us go. And well, if you have questions or you haven't formulated questions yet, we're going to have time at the end for questions. So the next thing I'm going to cover is assessing the subject. So now you we've talked about you, we've talked about analyzing job descriptions. Let's talk about the actual skill that you need to learn. What kind of questions do you need to ask yourself in order to plan your learning journey? There are three questions that you're going to be thinking about. The first one is test. 
Now, I say test, and I know that there are some people out there who are starting to get nervous already. But in this situation, I'm not talking about tests like at the end, you know, the final exam in a, in a class where you're getting graded and it, it makes you feel bad if you don't do a good job, or, you, know, you feel like a bad person. This is not like that at all. What we're talking about here is something that's talked about a lot in books about learning. It's low stakes assessment measures. And there are two things that are involved with this. The first is you're trying to figure out how much you know. Um, at different times in your learning journey. And the only way to do that is if you test yourself. Um, these tests aren't a big deal. What they do is they tell you what you know and what you don't know and what you need to work on later. So you do a lot of different tests or you do, you know, it could be a, an exam, it could be a practice project, and then you identify, oh, here, this, these are my sticking points. Here's what I need to work on when I practice later. And the other thing is, and I'll talk about this a little bit later too, is when you're testing yourself, it's also helping you actually learn. When you do low stakes assessment, while you're a little bit anxious about not knowing something, when you're doing the test, the actual process of thinking about that test actually helps with retention. And this is something that's been scientifically proven. The next two ways to assess a subject are competence or mastery and method. What's the best way to learn? And I have separate slides for this. So let's jump right into competence. There was an excellent article put together by Stewart and Hubert Dreyfus in 1980, a five stage model of the mental activities involved in directed skill acquisition. In this article, Dreyfus and Dreyfus put together these different levels of competence or mastery, and the mental functions that are associated with them. Now, I'm going to break down this table for you. And this article is actually available for free online. So if you're interested in reading it later, it's actually quite good. And I can, I can send you a link. So let's talk about breaking down this table uh, by talking about driving. Most of us have learned to drive. And compared to some other skills, you can go from being a novice driver to at least being proficient or an expert driver in a few months. So we can all kind of understand the different stages here. So when you start as a novice, you're really just getting the lay of the land. So imagine yourself sitting in the car with a relative or a driving instructor, and you're not driving it. So that's why the recollection is non-situational. You're just learning, okay, here's a steering wheel, here are the brake pedal, here's the turn signal, here's how I have to adjust the mirrors. You're sort of not really even in the situation of driving on the road. You might maybe maybe you're gonna drive in the parking lot just to get really get a sense of the car. Now, once you get on the road, you're moving into the position of competent. And the difference here is that now it's situational, so you're on the road. And your recognition, though, is still decomposed. And what that means is that you're thinking about every single step that you have to take, no matter what you're doing. So if you're making a right turn, you're thinking, OK, I'm making a right turn. Keep my hands here. Now I have to check the mirror. And I have to check the other mirror. Now I have to see if, you know, turn the wheel this much. Oh, there's any cars there. Do I have to wait now to turn? So you see, you're breaking it down into these minute steps. And we know we do this when we're starting anything. We're, we have, we're so wrapped up in the task that we have, to, we have to literally break it all the way down. Once somebody becomes proficient, they stop doing that. You now can just make a right turn. You say, I have to make a right turn, and you just do it. And you don't think about every little step. You know, you're, you're sitting in the car and you get going. You're basically just going, OK, I have to get from point A to point B. And you get in the car and you drive. But when you're proficient, your, your decision mental function is still analytical. And so because you don't have that much experience, perhaps, in the skill, you're still thinking uh, a lot about every decision you have to make. So you might be thinking, do I make a right turn here? You know, you're thinking at a higher level. You're not like within how to make a right turn. But you're still, do I have to make a right turn here? Or is this the best time to switch lanes? You're still kind of considering it. Moving into the expert stage, you're, you now have an intuitive 
feeling about these things. You've done, you've driven enough where you just know when to switch lanes, when to make a right turn, when you can run the yellow light. Um, it's You're not really working your brain to figure out the pros and cons of these things. So there's not that much difference actually between expert and master. And it's hard to determine what that difference is in the example of driving on the street. Now, if you're a race car driver, now is where mastery really takes hold. So as you can see, the main difference between expert and master is that your awareness, it goes from monitoring, which is like paying attention to what's going around you, to absorb. And absorbed means that you're in the flow. So when you're driving a race car, it's you're going at 100 something miles an hour. And so you're you're totally absorbed in the activity. You're in the flow when you're going around. If you're an NASCAR, you're going around in circles. You're totally in the flow there. Now, most people who are expert drivers on the street also getting into get into the flow in a bit, but maybe the other way where we're not paying attention, we're listening to an audiobook and we're so wrapped up in it that we're gonna miss our exit. So these are the different levels of competence. And so no matter what skills we're thinking about, we can break them down into these levels of competence. And if you want me to break it down for any other skill that you can think of, Grant, if I have some experience with that skill, I can break it down for you at the end of the program. Next, let's get to the nitty gritty of the best way to learn something. There are many different methods to learn and I've broken out a few for you here. So we've got on-demand lessons. A lesson is a short, uh, like a short course on something, not even a course, just, you know, like how to learn a bow tie, that's a lesson. You know, how to do pivot tables in Excel, that could be a few lessons actually. Um, on-demand means you can get it anytime you want. So YouTube is the perfect example of on-demand lessons. And YouTube is great. I actually learned how to tie bow tie <laughs> on YouTube. Now, the thing about YouTube though, is that there's a lack of credibility and context. So credibility, it means anybody can put something up on YouTube. If I wanted to put up a video on about underwater basket weaving, I could do that, but I've never done underwater basket weaving. But if you're a beginner, you might not know that. And the other thing is context. So context means that sometimes you'll get things on YouTube, and especially if you're a beginner, and particularly for software, where you'll see there's so many lessons on Microsoft Word, and you're gonna be thinking, well, okay, there's so many lessons, which one do I choose? Um, and you might choose one that's 10 years old or using an outdated version of the software. The other thing is that you might not know exactly what you need to know. And so while YouTube has a great abundance of high quality lessons on almost any topic, um, it might be more worthwhile to use a service like LinkedIn Learning which also has, I think, 17,000 different courses. But they're broken down in a way where you know that the person that's teaching the course is credible, that they have, they've written books and have a lot of experience in the topic, and that what you're learning is exactly what you need to know now about the updated software. And it breaks down for you the skills, especially if you're taking a beginner class, it'll do a high level introduction. So you kind of have an understanding of the skill. Now, LinkedIn Learning is available for free from our website. Um, if you go to our website, right in the middle in the, in the, in the navigation bar is just online learning. You click there, um, it used to be lynda.com. So you're gonna, it, you, it may stay, stay, still say lynda.com, but it's, if, it, if it does, it's gonna say LinkedIn Learning very soon because it just changed like literally yesterday. So then we got on-demand class, that's similar to a class, so we, on-demand classes here, for an example, are like sailor.org. Now sailor.org brings resources from all over the web. It, it takes textbooks, videos, text, and it puts them in a curriculum for you on, a, on many, many different topics. And all of these resources have a bunch of different classes available. Next, traditional class. We all know what that is. It usually it has a teacher that we've got students and it can be online or in person, but it operates essentially in, in a similar way to what, what we've all experienced in school. Next is a boot camp. Now for those who aren't familiar, a boot camp is learning 
a topic in a very concentrated and usually short period of time. This is often the case with uh, programming. And so you will learn uh, you know, a certain programming language or like data science or something. You'll, t you'll take classes for two weeks and all you'll be doing during that two weeks is data science. You're gonna wake up at nine in the morning, go to class, and then you can come home and do homework for two weeks. And so by the end of that two weeks, the idea is that you will have mastered at least gained some level of competence in data science, ideally enough to apply for a job in that field. I put books here, but really I mean any kind of text, like audio, you know, whether it's in, you're accessing it as an audio book or a book or websites online. Uh, the thing about learning from books is that it really requires you to be self-motivated and a self-learner. Like if you're, if you have a lot of experience learning by yourself, and especially if you know something about the topic, then it's ideal. But there are some people who need a little bit of extra push or like to have a community around them. And that's something that you would know uh, for yourself by doing the initial self-assessment. There are also some topics that are much better covered in ways other than text. And there's some that are great with text. Finally, I've included deliberate practice here, but really deliberate practice applies to all methods that you do. And deliberate practice means that you're not just phoning it in when you're practicing at home with whatever skill you're trying to learn. You know, if you're not, you're not coming home with your, if you're learning like ukulele or something and just kind of strumming for no reason. With del deliberate practice, you're trying to focus on exactly what you need to learn, sort of, and you really be reflective about your learning. So what that means is that, remember when I talked about assessment measures, like a test or you know a practice like if if you get an assignment in a class to do whatever it is with a skill and you didn't do a good job on something it's like i said before oh i didn't do so well on this so i need to deliberately work on that specific element of whatever the skill is so i want to also just go down and go through a few of these resources here because we've got some really good stuff here and all of this stuff by the way is free um, so Mango, I talked about YouTube already. Everybody knows about YouTube. Uh, Mango is a language learning program also available for free from the library. And what I love about Mango is that it brings together that skill and that knowledge because it'll give you how to speak the language. It'll tell you, talk, talk to you about grammar. It'll talk to you about, uh, you know, different vocabulary and there's audio and you can record yourself and listen to yourself, but it also has sections on the different cultures that speak a language, which I, which really draws me to it. So I would say that even if you're not extremely interested in learning a language at the moment, sometimes go, just going to Mango and browsing languages, trying a few of the classes will get you interested in it. It's, it's fantastic. I've used it for a few different languages. Like before I traveled to, to France, I did some of the French stuff and I don't speak a lot of French. I speak very, very, very little French, but I was able to understand some menus at restaurants because of Mango languages. LinkedIn Learning is something I already talked about. It used to be lynda.com. Now it's LinkedIn, a lot more courses, um, and really a lot of great stuff on technical topics, on soft skills, of communication, leadership. I was looking yesterday about writing fiction, and there's actually courses on writing fiction at LinkedIn Learning. There's also a course about content creation. So if you wanna make a living as a writer, you can also see about different ways to make a living as a writer via LinkedIn Learning. Khan Academy is, similar to LinkedIn Learning and YouTube, but it's usually, it's also videos and they're high quality, credible videos, but they're usually more basic topics, like high school level topics. So if you need to brush up on the fundamentals of math or grammar or, you know, history or whatever other topic that you need the basics of, Khan Academy is where you can go and you can know that what you're getting is good. We've talked about sailor.org. Now, Coursera and edX are examples of massive online classes. And oftentimes these classes come from a variety of topics and were created by teachers from top universities, Harvard, Stanford, Wharton School of Business. Um, and they create these courses for anybody online to be able to take. 
and oftentimes there are a bunch of students taking those courses with you and there's often forums there although sometimes there's TAs or even the professors hanging out at those forums most of the time those classes have been around for a long time and it's just students hanging out at those classes and so if you want to build a community about around learning a certain topic or you're interested in communicating with other people who are interested in learning the skill uh, which as you'll find out later I highly recommend um, these courses are a really good thing to check out Universal Classes is similar, but not, you're, it doesn't involve other people. There's a bunch of different courses that are available and you get video, text, sometimes audio. And you really have to be self-motivated to do that, to do even like edX, Coursera, Sailor, Universal Class, because there's nobody back there that's gonna be pushing you. Uh, so you have to really plan your time and study. Open Textbook Library is another one of those things that requires a lot of self-motivation. Everything requires self-motivation. Uh, Open Textbook Library is a collection of textbooks on different topics. And so if you already know about a topic and you want to learn more, or if you want to just get started and dip your toe into something, you can go there, you can download the textbook, and it's just a regular textbook, but it's free and available for you online. Many people already know about Duolingo. It's, this is a language learning app that gamifies learning language. So it creates that motivation for you. You know, if you log in for 15 minutes, it gives you some kind of ribbon. And if you do a certain amount of assessment, it gives you a, it gives you a ribbon. It's really nice. Uh, my brother uses it and he was just telling me how much he, he enjoyed it. Finally, saving maybe the best for last. I don't know. I, I really like Gabe Course. I've taken a bunch of courses. Now, Gale Courses is more like a traditional course than an on-demand class, except for the class itself isn't in real time. So the way it works is there's six-week classes, and they usually start every six weeks on different topics. And the content is released, I think, back when I took a course, it was every Wednesday and Friday. It may have changed now. And so you do, it's mostly text, you go through the content, sometimes they give you homework, and then there's a forum where you can communicate with the students and the professor. And these professors are very generous. I mean, these classes, this is free. Um, these professors will answer student questions, you can communicate with other students, and they get back to you, from my experience, within 24 hours. It's, sometimes it's even shorter. Some of the professors are just seems like they're on there all day long, which is really great if you're learning something. I learned, uh, I took a class on, I've took a bunch of classes, but I've, I took a class on content management systems, which is a web design thing. It's like WordPress and it's all the, the back end of a lot of different systems. And um, it, that can be a bit more challenging because there's a lot of programming involved. And so you, if you have trouble with the assignment, you can just ask on the forum and people will help you. So these are the, the different methods and resources for learning. And now, we're getting towards the end of our program, and I wanna leave you with some practical tips, things that you can take with you on your way out. So I talked about this a little bit before. Study with a teacher, another learner, or a community. This is almost like a superpower of learning, learning with other people. Because when you're learning by yourself, you have nobody to you have nobody to sort of interact with. You have nobody to bounce ideas off of. If you have a problem or you're not able to solve whatever you're doing, um, having somebody else, even if they're a co-learner, even if they're just learning at the same level as you, um, is just another brain to help you. Also, you, you stay motivated because you've got somebody else going, okay, I'm on this chapter, where are you? Now, the other thing is that, you know, I talked about ukulele before. I, I started learning ukulele a few years ago and I am not a musical person. I practically have a tin ear. And so I tried to learn from YouTube because there's so many ukulele videos on YouTube. And I literally couldn't, I couldn't tell if I was doing the same thing that the person on YouTube was doing. So I started studying with a teacher and that changed everything because that person who was an expert, was a master, um, was able to give me feedback on exactly what I was doing, was able to assess my skills. So it's like, you know, we're talking about different kinds of assessment. Having a teacher look at you, play whatever homework they gave you, that's a form of assessment. You know, it's it's low stakes because if you mess up, you know, so what? You're going to be messing up all the time. But the teacher can say, oh, you messed up for this reason. And so when you go home, you need to work on this. Uh, and that's very helpful. 
I was also in talking about ukulele. I also studied with a community and I had a ukulele group at my library. And so I was able to have fun playing with people. So, it was, you know, I was cultivating my interest in ukulele as I was improving my skills. Scheduling time. I always talk, I've been talking about motivation this whole time and sort of self motivation and discipline. Scheduling time is also something that you really, as adults, you know, kids, kids go to school, you know, they've got set time where they're learning, they have homework when they get home. As adults, and especially if we're busy, if we're also doing all the job seeking stuff, we really need to set time aside to do the learning, whether it's 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, if it's every day, every other day, just weekends, setting aside time and putting it in your calendar means that you can't go, oh, I don't feel like it today. I'm going to do it tomorrow. No, this is the time you set aside. So this is the time that you need to learn. In the same vein, you have to push yourself. Learning is hard, especially the, the more mastery you gain, the harder it becomes. And so you need to have self-discipline and you, you need to motivate yourself and push yourself, whatever that takes. If you want to reward yourself with a uh, candy or some, a nice coffee afterward, then, then do what it takes, but don't push yourself too much. There's nothing worse, you know, theoretically than if you're learning something, if you just push, push, push yourself to learn something, and then you burn out and decide, you know what, I'm sick of this. I'm never going to do it again not good for a job search, not good for, you know, matching those skills in the job description and just feels bad. You don't want to, you don't want to over your tire yourself because that harms retention. I've been talking about the benefits of assessment. Pressure testing is similar. It's, it, it's a term that often is used in martial arts where if you're learning self-defense and you never actually use that even at 75%, uh, of force, then how do you know that your skills work? How do you know that your movements are effective? It's the same with almost any skills that you learn. You actually have to do the skill. So I like to think about uh, public speaking with this. And I know that people are, there's a lot of people that are afraid of public speaking, but the reality is that there's no better way to learn. I would actually, I would even say that there's no other way to learn public speaking than to actually get up in front of people and talk. And that's why Toastmasters is so great, because not only does Toastmasters force you to give speeches, um, but you also get assessed by people. You, there's With every speech that you give, there's somebody who serves as an evaluator, and they answer certain questions about your talk. So there's some talks where you're focused on vocal variety. There's some talks where you're focused on outlining your talk. And by going through this process, where you're essentially doing low stakes talks, you know, as a five to seven minute talks at different meetings, you're able to pressure test your skills and you know, you're talking in often in front of strangers um, or people you don't know that well. And so, you know, when your skills are starting to improve and you're putting yourself in that difficult situation with the skill. If you're, if you're not talking about public speaking, if you're not talking about something that's sort of public, then, you know, if we're talking about like Microsoft Excel or even like social media, you know, just using it of social media, particularly like posting, like trying to trying to interact on it is pressure testing your skills. If you're doing Excel, then think about a think about it, something that you would actually be doing at work and do that. And then if you have somebody who knows about Excel, then have them test your work, have them have them uh, see if what you've done is good or if there are better ways that you can do it and then use whatever feedback they give to. Inform your deliberate practice. Finally, cultivate interest. And we're we're getting towards the end here, and I know that there are probably people out there going, interest, hmm, interest. I need to learn this skill to get a job. And that's true. We can't all be interested in everything. But I will tell you that interest is important, not just because it makes learning more pleasurable, but also because it actually helps your cognition. When you are interested in something, you learn it better. I think back to people I knew in high school, some of the people who were, you know, not very good students, but at the same time knew every single player that played on the Lakers and knew all of their stats and knew who the Lakers were playing and all of the other people who were on the other team and knew their whole record. And for the past few years, they kept all that stuff in their head. 
So because they were interested in it, they were able to maintain that knowledge. So cultivating interest is about thinking of what the possibilities are with the skill that you're learning. So if you're learning the skill for job description, it's going to help you get a job. It's going to help you open up other areas of your life. If you need to cultivate interest, you might also think about how what you're doing relates to things you already know and try to parlay that. Now, you can also just think, well, you know, you're like, I'm interested in Microsoft Excel. That's weird. Most people don't care about spreadsheets. Most people find spreadsheets boring. But I learned Microsoft Excel, or I became, you know, more of an intermediate user, maybe slightly more advanced than intermediate, because it helped me with my job. Because when I, a few years ago, I was keeping a lot of different kind of stats, and I was often asked those stats, and I would have to go in and I have to fiddle with my numbers, and it would take me a long time to come up with the answers for those stats. And so I developed an interest in Excel because it was useful. Because by learning about like pivot tables, I could bring up, I could take huge tables and condense them into usable information. And I could pull out different types of information very quickly. And so that usefulness became, became an interest. And so I've been learning about Excel since then because I use it in my job. All right, we've reached the end of the presentation. And so I want to leave you on a high note. Psychologist Carol Dweck wrote in her book, Mindset, The New Psychology of Success, about two different types of mindset, a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. Now, I have a definition of the growth mindset on the slide here. But the essence of it is that no matter who you are, no matter what skills you come with, no matter what your family background is, no matter what you've done in your life, you can learn skills. It really comes down to time and effort. If you put in the time, if you put in the effort, if you use some of the tips that we've talked about today, then you can learn, even if you're afraid. You can learn practically anything. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope that you got some useful and practical tips for learning skills as a job seeker. Thank you everyone for coming to our event today. I hope that this was helpful. Thank you to Oleg and everyone have a wonderful night.